Alright, hello again from the Ronald Reagan Minuteman Missile State Historic Site. My name's Rob, I'm the site supervisor out here. It's a rainy day out, so we decided to give a, a little presentation, a little specialized presentation, on what made, you know, those Minuteman 2 and Minuteman 3 missiles so important and so lethal, uh, basically towards that mid-Cold War period. And a lot of that had to do with warhead miniaturization. So it's going to get a little, you know, what they call Strange Love Yen, if you've ever seen that movie Dr. Strange Love. We're going to talk about nuclear weapons efficiencies, um, you know, miniaturization, specialization, uh, safety techniques that they basically put on later nuclear weapons, and uh, basically how we got from 1945 to now. So let's get started. All right, we're going to look at the first nuclear weapons here in 1945, um, you know, aptly named the Mark I and Mark III bombs. Uh, the Mark II was kind of a failed design. Actually, Mark I was the little boy. Mark III was the fat man design, and Mark II was actually known as the thin man. Um, a whole different story there, but it didn't work, basically. So essentially, you know, the first thoughts uh, with nuclear weapon design was, uh, through that Manhattan Project, getting something done very quickly. The Mark I uh, design basically used two spheres of uranium-235 shot at each other at very high speed to create a fission yield, as it was called. Um, the problem was it wasn't very efficient, um, but the scientists were so assured that it would blow up and do its job that basically uh, they never tested it. Um, in July 45, they did test that Mark III design, and essentially this is the uh, grandfather of all current uh, nuclear weapons. This is what uh, the United States essentially went with, and essentially the Soviet Union copied off of us. So um, you're looking at uh, uranium... Uh, sphere right here. Basically, we think this might be kind of a recreation of the Louis Sloten incident. Um, that's a heck of a story on its own. But essentially, you know, that the radioactivity being let off here, they needed to find a way to release it. So back again, that Mark I, you slam them into each other hard enough, um, they will detonate. You know, that was dropped over Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. 13.5 kiloton, roughly, explosion. The amount of uranium material that actually fissioned uh, weighed less than a dollar. It's what nuclear weapons scientists would call a very, very inefficient design. And in fact, it was so inefficient, they kind of cast it aside after World War II. Whereas the Mark III, on the other hand, yielded about 20 kilotons. It was a little bit more efficient. But instead of a gun barrel design, as they called it, they used a sphere of plutonium surrounded by basically what looked like a soccer ball of high explosives. You compressed that plutonium. Uh, you got the yield, and the, uh, the bomb exploded. So this is the one that was dropped over Nagasaki um, on August 9th, 1945. Did a little bit less damage, uh, fewer casualties because of the way it was dropped. But the United States saw, hey, this is the way forward. So going from there, you know, a, a lot of Cold War histories go right from um, 1945 into 1950, where Truman authorizes uh, the development of the thermonuclear bomb. But there's a lot of interesting things that happened in between there and then. Um, you know, right after 1945, the nuclear weapons apparatus in the United States kind of languished. Um, Los Alamos Laboratories uh, was taking over eventually um, uh, as a component of the uh, Manhattan Project. Um, it was later joined by Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Laboratories out in California to develop nuclear weapons. But essentially, you're looking at 1946, it's not on here, but Operation Crossroads really wasn't anything to do with uh, nuclear weapons development. In fact, uh, the bomb that was dropped, um, that first ABLE shot, um, was probably going to be destined to be that third nuclear weapon dropped on Japan, had it came, uh, come to that point. But uh, more interestingly is Operation Sandstone. This is where you're starting to see um, more intensified weapons development as far as fission weapons. So shot X-ray here, um, I believe that's in a we talk at all, um, yielded 49 kilotons. That's about twice, a little over twice the amount that was ever, you know, experienced before with nuclear weapons because they were basically making them a little more efficient. You were combining uranium and plutonium in those cores and uh, they're just basically finding a way to slim down nuclear weapons as well. So you're going from the Mark III into the Mark IV, which looks a little more streamlined. Um, and in, you know, a short amount of time, you get the Mark VI nuclear weapon that went into mass production. Um, and that's something to point out, too, is that the Mark III was very much a handmade weapon. Um, 
it was really difficult to produce many of them and it, they were very difficult to basically keep ready for use. So that's what they were working for uh, with sandstone and greenhouse here. Greenhouse, um, 1951, um, there was shot George, 225 kilotons. It was the largest yield up, up, up yeah, excuse me, up at that point. But shot item at 45.5 kilotons was a little more interesting because they're using uh, liquefied deuterium and uh, I believe tritium boosted into the core um, to get that extra oomph of energy basically uh, for a nuclear detonation. So that becomes very important in nuclear weapons development from then on out. And especially these are the first early thermonuclear experiments with nuclear weapons. So Operation Ivy shot Mike was 10.4 megatons. Um, if you've ever seen pictures of this, um, you know, the, 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 the building that this kind of weapon, this experiment was contained within, it was huge. There was no way they were going to put these on man bombers. Um, so essentially, it's a cryogenic weapon. Um, you had to have refrigerators working to cool, um, the, I believe it was the deuterium, um, and that produced quite a big yield. So um, from 1952, you know, they're, they're thinking, you know, maybe cryogenic weapons are the way to go. They're really bulky. We can only carry them by B-36 bombers. Um, but let's see where we can go from here. So um, things really changed up in uh, Operation Castle. Um, Bravo is mentioned most uh, often. Um, shot Romeo uh, at 11 megatons um, occurred shortly after uh, Castle Bravo. But basically, you're looking at weapons that were thought to maybe detonate it if they were lucky, five megatons. You know, Romeo was 11, uh, Castle Bravo was 15. Excuse me, you're using a dry deridium fuel that they really didn't believe was gonna make a big impact on nuclear weapon development. They were very much surprised. In fact, Castle Bravo could be recognized as America's greatest radiological incident because it, it kind of got out of hand. So um, right from there, they're developing Within a year, they're developing these emergency capability weapons, the Mark 17, the Mark 24, um, very large nuclear weapons. You know, again, you can only carry them with the B-36, but 15 megatons. Um, they started producing those very rapidly in those mid-1950s. But shortly thereafter, you're looking at the Mark 15 bomb that had been um, under development. Uh, you know, you're promising a thermonuclear weapon in a lot smaller package that can be carried by, say, a B-47 bomber which would be a lot smaller than that B-36. Uh, Mark 15s, and I believe that was supersede, superseded by the Mark 39. Um, low megaton, but they're building lots and lots and lots of those bombs. So uh, basically throughout the late 1950s, uh, Lawrence Livermore and uh, Los Alamos are churning out bomb designs, and the nuclear weapons apparatus of the United States is just, it, it's massive. It's a huge industry. Um, you have component design, component construction out there in Kansas City. They're building, you know, some of the explosives in Burlington, Iowa, um, all over the United States. Um, it becomes just a major part of the Cold War, um, you know, story. Uh, you know, while thermonuclear weapons are growing in size, um, the fission bombs were shrinking quite a bit. You know, they're trying to make them more efficient and smaller for the uh, nuclear battlefield, you know, they thought this was a way to, you know, stop that manpower advantage in Central Europe in case the Russians had attacked. So, kind of the first of these, the first uh, battlefield nuclear weapons um, that's really notable is the Atomic Annie uh, 280 millimeter artillery gun. This was very unwieldy, it was very hard to transport, but it demonstrated a uh, atomic battlefield capability on the part of the United States. It was shooting a shell that roughly had the yield a little bit bigger than the Hiroshima bomb. Um, otherwise, you're starting to see some guidance in uh, missile design. Honest John was not guided. It was a fin-stabilized, um, uh, I think they called it brigade, brigade level um, weapon uh, to, you know, protect and, uh, you know, attack those uh, potential Russian armor columns coming through in Germany. Uh, Davy Crockett, of course, uh, is well known in Cold War lore as being like kind of the smallest nuclear weapon. Um, very low kiloton. You know, it wasn't going to prove to be a very practical design. Um, there's some actually cool footage out there in 1961 or 62 of then Attorney General Robert Kennedy out there watching 
uh, a test of one of these uh, weapons. So if you're getting shot at and you're in a Russian tank, you really didn't want to be at the end of that. But from what we understand, you didn't want to be shooting it either because uh, the lethal radius was uh, not looking good on either side. So. The first missile warheads, meanwhile, you're starting to see early developments, um, especially, you know, Sputnik is that well-known one, 1957. You know, Jupiter and Thor were underway by 1955, as was Atlas, uh, the Teapot Committee, committee um, getting that going in 54. And something to note here is just you're starting to see already the miniaturization of technology in that the Russians, you know, you're looking at a very large unwieldy missile. In fact, I believe they only deployed six of these, uh, four to six, as nuclear weapons and the readiness availability of these rockets were very, very poor. Um, Atlas and Titan were much better on the American side, um, but they were also quite troubled. But just considering how small Atlas is compared to the SS-6, and then how big Atlas is compared to Minuteman, uh, you know, in the space of 10 years, 1955, you're looking at very large thermonuclear weapons. In 1965, you're up here at Grand Forks, and they're developing, you know, Minuteman II, so they're getting them into the ground. But, you know, with warheads, this is something we'd like to point out, is that, you know, the tips of these missiles, that, you know, we usually call them warheads just for ease, uh, for sake of saying what they are. They're actually the re-entry vehicle. So the nuclear warhead is actually possessed inside the re-entry vehicle. So this is an Atlas F Mark IV re-entry vehicle. These were meant to protect them as they came in through the atmosphere from friction. And essentially they started out with, uh, I believe it was Thor, they were looking at a copper-based re-entry vehicle heat sink. Um, they went to ceramics a little bit thereafter. So. But just to compare, you know, the reentry vehicle size, the Russians were, you know, trying to catch up as far as uh, weapons development as well. But this is something to point out by the Cuban Missile Crisis. We had a lot more ICBMs in the arsenal ready to go. Um, you know, the SS-7, the Nadellan incident, um, they were kind of worried as far as the readiness capability of those rockets as well. But of course, the SS-4 and the SS-5, where they had those down in Cuba, um, you know, we're threatening American targets directly, so. 1960s, you're seeing a rapid development in technology. You know, the Mark 11 reentry vehicle, uh, possessing the uh, W-56 nuclear warhead, about 1.5 megatons. You're looking at, you know, nuclear weapons kind of shrinking, not only in size, but in yield, because, you know, Atlas and Titan, you know, Atlas had something around a three to four megaton nuclear warhead. Um, Titan II's had those nine megaton nuclear warheads, definitely the heavy hitters of the American fleet. Minuteman II's and then III's didn't really need to be that big. Um, basically, they're fairly accurate, so you didn't need basically a sledgehammer to kill a fly was kind of the analogy is how it went. And the same was kind of going with uh, nuclear bombs. And this is kind of an ex explanation here. It's one modification of the B-28, uh, Mark 28 free fall nuclear bomb that was carried by a number of uh, aircraft in the U.S. arsenal, including B-52s um, and even tactical aircraft, but showing how small what this is what they would call the physics package. Uh, the nuclear actual components of the bomb were quite a bit smaller than you thought, um, just demonstrating how things were really quickly advancing in the 1960s. So uh, we'll go from here on into the Minuteman III, and I love this picture because it does a really good job of explaining how things really uh, came to be. Um, you know, with Minuteman III, you're starting to see specialization as far as, you know, the, the re-entry vehicles, those Mark 12s, I believe there are Mark 21s today, that would have been on MX Peacekeeper missiles, but the W-78 warheads that were possessed within these, you know, the W-87s today, look how big, you know, a person is compared to them. I, it's about this size. When you're looking at uh, the Mark III and then my, Mark IV, a variant of... Uh, the Fat Man bomb, you know, it's, it's quite a bit bigger. The first fusion bombs, very large. And uh, just the development over time of how electronics um, really shrunk the need um, and guidance, essentially, for the size of nuclear weapons. So you're starting out in World War II with, you know, 20 kilotons. That's really not considered very big today. Um, it's kind of a dark way to look at it, but, you know, 15 megatons, uh, you're looking at Tsar Bomba in 1961, dropped by the Russians, um, a yield of 50 megatons. 
you know, they just eventually, you know, develop. You're, you're going from bomber fleets uh, with certain limitations on accuracy with, uh, you know, push-button warfare with the Minuteman and Peacekeeper missiles, um, much more accurate. And there again, you didn't need a huge nuclear weapon to destroy what you were looking at. Late in the Cold War, there were still some developments going on, some specializations. Uh, something to point out, um, you can read a lot about that in the book Command and Control, was uh, nuclear safety. Uh, weak link, strong link technology, basically a lot of safety components to make sure these weapons wouldn't detonate inadvertently. Um, you know, if they were under, if they were in a burning at a fire, um, if they were hijacked somehow, um, different ways to make sure they wouldn't inadvertently explode. But the W-80 warhead, still fairly potent, being loaded upon, upon a, uh, inside, excuse me, an air-launched cruise missile, um, and these types were carried by B-52 bombers. Just to kind of demonstrate, that's a strategic warhead, as they call it. So it's a large nuclear weapon that has really shrunk over time. And, you know, the special atomic demolition munition, you know, I see this picture and it's just kind of weird to see, you know, it's a nice carpeted office looking area. You got slat board there and here's a nuclear weapon that's kind of just sitting there like a, a bucket. Um, these were meant to be deployed by special forces in Europe, again, in case of a uh, Soviet attack. Um, you place them under bridges, um, different strategic points. And, you know, the yield wasn't huge, but if you put a nuclear weapon under a bridge, I, the bridge is pretty safely gone. Um, at that point. So just to kind of go over things, what we talked about today, fission efficiency, um, 1945 to 1949, just finding ways to make the bombs easier to handle, um, potentially more explosive and uh, smaller to be carried by uh, different aircraft. Uh, thermonuclear development in 1950 to 55, you're seeing bombs getting bigger with thermonuclear weapons um, and then quickly growing smaller again after the, basically 1954, Castle Bravo really changed a lot for thermonuclear weapon development, at least in the United States. Battlefield weapons are really shrinking, um, you know, throughout the rest of the Cold War, essentially. Um, they're using, they went down to 155 millimeter shell in Europe. They're looking at, um, there was a lot of different battlefield nuclear weapons that are eventually deployed. Um, in 1955 to 1970, I mean, you're, you're in the space age, you're seeing miniaturization is just a big word to take away from this today, is that things were just getting smaller. You didn't need to have a massive room-sized nuclear weapon. Um, you're making a, a reentry vehicle and a nuclear warhead that's, you know, about as tough, big as I am. Um, in fact, probably a little bit smaller than I am. So... Uh, 1970 to 1992, you're looking at, again, a specialization of nuclear weapons, uh, especially the safety aspects of them. Dial yield um, is kind of one of my favorite terms because it's such a weird thing to look at with nuclear weapons. Um, going back to that B-28 bomb, um, they could be set down to, well, not, not, I'm kind of getting technical here. Um, actually, that more included the B-61 bomb, where they can decide if they wanted to make it a smaller explosion or a bigger one, um, basically with little modifications. Uh, the Mark 28 actually carried different um, modifications for the different size of weapons. Uh, you're looking at neutron weapons and uh, just different ideas of how to use them, ground-penetrating nuclear weapons that briefly saw reemergence in the early 2000s. And right now we're looking at low-yield nuclear weapons, um, possibly deployed among Trident uh, missiles um, as a different method of conducting warfare. So we'll end it with that. Uh, we thought about doing a rendition of uh, We'll Meet Again, uh, you know, after Dr. Strangelove. A uh, little dark, also a little uh, don't have the copyrights on that. So instead we're going to talk about that we're accepting uh, reservations, excuse me, um, for tours, uh, we're starting up June 15, 2020. We're at 701 797 3691. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on tour this summer. If not, then uh, we'll see you later on. So, uh, from the Ronald Reagan Minuteman Missile State Historic Site, my name's Rob again, and we'll talk to you next time.